Anwar Azim woke up covered in sweat. Her head was heavy and her vision blurry. Clinging to the walls either side of her, she made her way to her daughter's bedroom. The house was modest and stood in Moulton, a large city in Pakistan. It was July 16, 2016, right in the thick of summer. But even accounting for the heat, Anwar was sweating more than usual. She called out to her 26-year-old daughter, Candil, who was staying for the night, that it was time for breakfast. But her calls were met with silence. When she finally reached her bedroom, it looked like Candil was still asleep. But as Anwar lifted the blanket from her face, she saw, in her own words, that Candil was no longer in this world. Anwar screamed in horror. Overnight, her daughter had been murdered in her bedroom. Before her death, Candil was one of the most famous people in Pakistan. The year prior, she was in the top 10 most Googled people in the country. A social media celebrity, she was often referred to as Pakistan's own Kim Kardashian, with more than 700,000 followers on Facebook. She was a woman who almost every Pakistani seemed to have an opinion on. And by the time of her murder, that would include her own family. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast looking into the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In this episode, I'm speaking with journalist and author Sanam Meher. Sanam's book, A Woman Like Her, investigates the short life of Kandil Baloch. In her research, Sanam pieced together Kandil's life from her birth in rural Pakistan to her incarnation as a social media celebrity. I spoke to Sanam just before she returned to her home country of Pakistan to take us through the life of Kandil, her impact on Pakistani culture and how her murder started a national discourse. How would you describe who Kandil Boloch was to the people of Pakistan in in early 2016. Kandil was Pakistan's first celebrity by social media. So she was the first person who went viral. A video of hers went viral. And she kind of figured out that the attention that she was getting over there could really be a means to something bigger. She was interested in acting. She wanted to be a singer. And... When she went viral, she really tried to figure out, okay, how can I forge a career out of people's attention? How do I hold their attention? How do I get them to talk about me? I think she really understood that in this day and age, fame allows you access to a number of opportunities. And as long as people were talking about her, it didn't even matter what they were saying about her. As long as they were talking about her, she was famous. And she wanted to become a household name, essentially. She started posting photographs and videos on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and slowly realized that the more risque they were, the more that people were talking about them. And as she sort of became more well-known, she was invited onto a lot of talk shows. She got a couple of acting gigs. She was invited onto these shows to sing. And so really the plan was working out, but she was the first person we'd seen who had that moment of going viral and then sort of made a career out of that and became a social media celebrity. And we know that people who master that make it look really easy, as though it all sort of happened by accident. But in the case of Candil, I think when we look at her career, she was very savvy. What was her appeal to the people who followed her on social media? What do you think her appeal was? I think she, as you're saying, yeah, she was extremely savvy. I think she's someone who had such a clear idea of how to curate this image of herself, how to create a persona that we would fully buy into and that we would be so sort of transfixed by her image that we would never look away from it long enough to ask, well, who is this young woman? Where has she come from? How come we're suddenly all talking about her? How did she suddenly arrive on the scene? And... The way that she did that is she gave us 
things that we couldn't stop talking about. We were so outraged by the things that she was saying or doing or how she presented herself. And she understood that really, I mean, the thing that would outrage us the most or get us to sort of want to see what she was doing the most was if she was putting out this image of herself as this sexy young woman who's posting these things late at night when her family is asleep. She used to tell stories about herself and say, you know, my family is really wealthy. I don't I don't do any of the social media stuff because I need the money or I need the acting jobs or the singing gigs. I'm doing it just because I like to get a rise out of you and I like your attention and I like to see what you think about me. So she really understood what would make us sit up and take notice and keep watching what she did. And I think she was such a clever curator of her own image in that sense. And she understood her audience. So for me, when I started looking at her and her life, it, it was really a question of, in her image, what do we see reflected back of ourselves? Why couldn't we stop looking at her? And if we could go back to 2013, which is sort of where it all started, she auditioned for Pakistan Idol. Can you describe how her audition went? Oh, it went terribly. The blooper reels that they run um, where they make fun of certain contestants or, you know, becomes a bit of a joke. Um, she actually ended up over there. And what she turned around later and said was that was completely planned. And she had gone in there and the producers had sort of taken a look at her and said, well, you know, would you be interested in kind of getting a conversation going? And you're not maybe going to end up on the show itself, but we want your audition to be like, just be a little bit hysterical, be kind of emotional or like make it really funny. And that's exactly what she did. If you watch her audition, she's sort of very over the top. Like she comes in and she says, no, I'm so nervous and I, I can't do it. And then the judges say like, no, no, come on, just give it a try. And then she starts singing and she's terrible and it sounds terrible. And you look at the judges' reactions and it was all really over the top and quite hammy. And then she walks out of there and she's sobbing. And But if you actually watch the video, you'll notice like she's covering her face. She's crying really loudly, but there's no tears. There's She's covered her face entirely and then she walks off and off camera you can still hear her sobbing. So, I mean, I think that's really one example where she understood, okay, I do want to be a singer. These are my ambitions. But the only way that I am getting that airtime and getting this interest from people is if I present myself in a certain way. If I am in character for them in this way, they're okay with me being here in this space. And I just need to get through the door. She understood that. And I think that was really reflected in whatever she did as she moved forward. She then started creating videos and sharing them across various social media platforms. And there's a lot of suggestion that, again, they sort of looked spontaneous and like these little, you know, five, ten second videos, but they were quite uh, curated and, and thought out. What were those videos and why do you think that they resonated so much with her audience? It was it was quite curated, but she was also copying a lot of stuff that she was seeing other people do all over the world. Um, there's a lot of instances when she would look at what a lot of Indian celebrities were doing and, you know, the kinds of videos that they'd post or sometimes even just verbatim repeating things that they'd said. Um, just one example, in 2016, she posted this video on her Facebook page where she's wearing this, like, lime green bikini and she's dancing to this song. And she posted and she says, you know, if Pakistan... So there was a cricket match going on at that time. India and Pakistan were playing the T20 World Cup. And she said, if Pakistan wins, this was just a trailer and I'll post a striptease on my Facebook page. And an Indian social media celebrity had done the exact same thing. Just, I think it was a couple of months prior. And there was a lot of outrage about it. And there was a lot of conversation going on around that. And she saw what was happening there and she copied the exact same thing because she knew, okay, yeah, this is going to get people talking and this is going to get me attention. And they're going to they're going to want to turn up on my Facebook page. Even if they hate what I'm doing, they're still going to turn up there, even if it's just to threaten me or to write hateful comments. But they're still going to be there. The video is still going to be watched. It's still going to be in the news. People are still going to be curious. So she was doing some stuff that she'd seen at work in other parts of the world. She saw what, if you even look at some of her hashtags, they're the same things that these sort of social media 
small time celebrities or these girls who put their pictures up online they're the same things that they were using and saying and she was just copying them and seeing what worked a lot of the time and how was that video the one where she sort of offered to do a strip tease if the team won how was that widely received by the community what were some of the commentary around that I spoke with this one journalist in the city of Multan where Kandil's parents lived and where she was killed and he said you know when I saw that I had never seen a woman behave in that way I'd never seen a woman talk in that way he just had never encountered it and if you think about it in a conservative society the women that we're encountering on public platforms the actresses the singers the models the tv show hosts whatever it is they are always dressed a certain way they're told to talk a certain way they understand where the red lines are and they won't cross them even just in public as a woman in pakistan you are dressing a certain way you are in public spaces in a certain way because you understand that that's just what the rules are kandil was doing things that people had never really seen women behave in those ways in pakistani society she did a bbc interview and she really set it up which also gives you a good sense of just how clever she was about this image of herself where she said i specifically want a shot where we're going to go to this fancy hotel in the city it has this huge swimming pool and i want a shot of me coming out of the pool and they were like okay sure and she said and then i'll start answering questions once i get out of the pool another young woman i spoke to again in multan she said that she saw that interview and she saw kandil in the pool and she's swimming and there's all these men around her that are just staring at her and just like what is this woman doing and there's these people filming her and what is happening here and she comes out of the pool and she looks really beautiful and then she sits there and she starts just starts answering questions and this young woman i spoke with she said i'd never seen someone just be so utterly uninhibited to not care that there were these people around her who were staring at her or just wondering what was going on or judging her she wanted to do it she wanted to be in that space in that way she was totally uninhibited about saying i want you to look at me and for a lot of people that confused them and it made them i think quite angry that you know why is this woman you know even though we're threatening her or we're judging her or trolling her or you know just saying you're so shameless why doesn't she back down like what kind of woman wouldn't back down but then for a lot of other people they saw that and they thought well this is amazing and it's amazing that i've never seen something like this and seen a woman put herself out there like this and refuse to back down even when she is shamed for it so those were the two kinds of reactions that she was getting a lot of the time This is a difficult question but for people who might not know a great deal about Pakistani culture and particularly the role of women within it how would you describe the world that she was rebelling against I think I understood on some level when we found out these details about her life that you know her real name was not Kandil a few weeks before she was killed a newspaper actually ran a photograph of her passport and they revealed her real name and they revealed where she came from and we found out that this woman had somehow managed to fool all of us and managed to create this image of herself that we had just completely been taken in by and i knew on some level then that wow it takes a lot of guts to do that and you have to be very clever to do that in this day and age to create a version of yourself that no one questions that no one looks beyond and no one asks well where did you really come from or who are you really and i understood that it took guts and you had to be very clever to do that but then when i traveled to her village it really hit me then and i understood her world then as we were driving up to the village you start to see a lot of billboards where there's only men in the ads for things like detergent or washing powder or whatever you look around you and you start to see that there's very few women even just in the marketplaces even buying like fruits and vegetables or the women are slowly slowly disappearing as you're sort of pulling up to the village i was with a man who's a local reporter in the area and i said something about this to him and he said yeah there's a village you know not too far from here where they don't give their women shoes and i was thinking well what does that even mean like 
you don't give your women shoes. And he said, well, think about it. If you walk out of your house and you're not wearing shoes, where are you going to be looking? You're always going to be looking down. You're never going to look up at the world around you. You're never going to look at any man around you. You're never going to look at what's going on around you. Your eyes are just going to remain on the ground. And I think that was the moment when I really understood the place that she came from. You know, when I even spoke with her mother, I was talking to her about your daughter was in an abusive marriage. She was married off when she was 16. And, you know, she tried to leave that marriage. And it was it was so terrible for her. And she kept coming to you and asking you for help. And her mother looked at me and she just said, well, we believe that once you go into your husband's home, the only way that you're leaving there is when you're dead, when it's for your own funeral. Like that's the only scenario in which you get to leave that home. So those are small things that there were moments when I felt a strange kind of culture shock. I mean, it was the same country. It's the place I've grown up in. It's it's what I understood on a very logical level. But to see it play out, that made me really understand the place that she came from. I think it gives a real sense of how transgressive she was and that story about, you know, the women not wearing shoes. It just, it tells you how much it meant and how rebellious it was for her to be the person who had eyes on her and and sort of had the guts to look back. I think to have a an idea for your life that is so different to what you've been told, that's so different to the options that you see around you. I don't think that that's easy at all to to sort of dream of a life where you want your name to be known, you want to be somebody, you want to make something of yourself. I mean, we say these things in these very broad terms all the time. But when it really comes down to it and you think about it, the fact that you can have that idea that there is something more, but then you really set out. You leave your husband. You walk out of that abusive marriage. Your parents don't support you. You leave your child behind because you understand that as a woman going out into this world and trying to do something, to have a small child with you, it was just untenable. And for her to turn around and this child that she loved so much and cared about so much to say, I need to leave you behind because otherwise I'm just not going to make it. There's just no way. It amazed me, honestly. It really, it, it moved me so much to see those places, to go to the shelter where, you know, when she left her husband's home, she ran away to this shelter to see what it was like in there. The fact that it's so grim and so difficult that so many women end up leaving that shelter and just going back to their homes because the devil you know is the better, you know? So that's when it really struck me. It's almost impossible to imagine. It then sort of, she's she's existing in this completely opposite world to the one that she was raised in, in a lot of ways. And in April 2016, she appeared alongside a senior cleric named Mufti Kavi on a comedy news show. Can you describe who he is? He's a cleric and a scholar. He's based in Multan, again, where Kandil's parents were living um, and where she was killed. And he's someone who is invited routinely onto these talk shows to be on these panels to give his religious opinion on everything from dating to if we're discussing, you know, transgender rights or like any topic that was coming up at the time because he was really... He gave good TV. I mean, he was funny. He wasn't the traditional, you know, really stern religious scholar or cleric sitting there and just passing judgment. He was quite jovial. He liked to joke around with all the guests. He would give these religious opinions, but he was also very friendly and seemed quite approachable. And that was his reputation. And he was quite a regular on these shows. Um, And on one show where Kandil was invited, he was on the show as well, sort of as like a, you know, as a person who was there to present a counterpoint to who Kandil was or what she was trying to do. Or I think the discussion really revolved around, oh, do you think, you know, like, what do we think about how women are using social media or presenting themselves on there? And what's the religious take on this? And he was actually quite kind to her and he didn't judge her. He didn't pass judgment. He wasn't scornful of her. He was almost like this older, like, family figure, like an uncle, and just kind of gently, you know, saying, like, I think you need to think about, you know, what you're doing or how you're presenting yourself. So he was quite kind to her, and they had fun on the show. 
And at the end of it, you know, they agreed that if he was going to visit Karachi, where Kandil lived, that, you know, they would get in touch and meet. And then he traveled there and, you know, she went to his hotel room to meet him. And afterwards, she tweeted out these photographs of the meeting. And in the meeting, you know, she's sitting like on the arm of his chair. His hair is a little disheveled. It's a little tousled. He's got like the buttons on his shirt are unbuttoned. He's, she's wearing his cap in one of the photos. She tweeted those out. And then a little while later, she shared that he had behaved really inappropriately with her. And he had refused to let anyone come into the room. Anytime someone would knock on the door, he would just get them to leave. He tried to kiss her. He tried to touch her. Every time she would refuse or ask him to back off, he would, but then he would come back even more forcefully. And she called her parents and told them that she had been really scared and she had wanted to leave. And she took these pictures with him and she thought, okay, well, I'll just tweet it out. You know, he's he's so well known and... The pictures made quite a stir. People were looking at him and thinking, what exactly is going on in this meeting and why have these two met? And then when she tweeted that, you know, like he behind closed doors is a completely different person to who you understand him to be. And this person who's been appearing on TV and you think he's like the friendly religious scholar who will kind of guide you through these difficult questions and you know, how, how are we supposed to be living now? And um, what's what's a good way to live your life as a good Muslim? And she said, well, he's a hypocrite. And he's just using religion to further his own interests. And he's a very different person to what you know him as. That created quite a stir. It was talked about everywhere. And Mufti Kavi became our national joke. He was the butt of our jokes. And for many young people who for so long have been living in a place where they are constantly receiving judgment from these clerics or these scholars who who are telling them how to live their lives, the rules that they have to live by, if you want to date someone, if you want to you know, have the freedom to get your own job or get educated or whatever it is, they always have an opinion there. You've lived with these people's opinions for so long And kind of moved your life around them and sort of shaped what you do around those opinions to have somebody turn around and say, actually, these people are hypocrites and we need to think about why we're listening to them. It was really important to a lot of young people and they really appreciated what Kandil had done and they rallied around her. Unfortunately, Mufti Kavi is from Multan where Kandil's parents were living and he had a huge support base over there. So then what happened was there were a number of journalists who then in Multan started to ask, well, who is this young woman? And she's sort of now getting into this area where it's not just these pictures and these videos of herself. Now she's starting to point fingers at other people, and we can't tolerate that. And so then it was actually a newspaper in Multan that ran a photo of her passport and revealed her identity and you know where she was from and her parents' home address and things like that. And people started to turn up at the family home and, you know, say things like, your daughter is so shameless and how are you allowing her to do these things? And why was she even in that hotel room? Why should we even believe somebody like her? Why is she accusing this man who's so dear to us? How can she be saying these things? So things started to spiral out of control at that point for Kandil. And you alluded previously to the fact that she had used a pseudonym and she was always reinventing herself and saying that she came from a wealthy family and she didn't need the money. But what this uncovered was that, of course, she didn't come from a wealthy family. She came from a very different background to what people so far knew. What had her upbringing been like and what had her life actually been like up until that point? What did the media uncover? I don't even think the media was that interested in trying to understand, you know, what kind of life she had. I think the only thing they were interested in and the story that kept coming out is whatever fed into people's judgment of her. A lot of it was, you know, of course you're doing these things on social media or you're putting out these kind of pictures because you're just this trashy woman who's come from this village in the middle of nowhere and you're tasteless and you're only these kinds of women do these kinds of things. So it was a lot about that. What we weren't hearing as much about is the fact that when she left her marriage and she 
had to sort of make her own way through the world. She did everything from acting on like stage, doing small theater productions, working as a bus hostess on these buses that would do these long journeys across the country. As a child, she, her parents really doted on her, especially her father, and they would spoil her quite a bit. Like she loved to sing, she loved to dance, she would do it anytime somebody would even visit their home. She loved to dress up in her brother's clothes and, you know, wear their like pants and shirts and kind of walk around the house. She loved to watch TV. She was kind of lazy about her chores. There was this stream outside their home. She loved to swim in there. So we weren't finding out those kinds of details. All we were learning and the media was interested in putting out is, oh, of course, now we understand. Because up until that point, I think there had been this real confusion. Anytime you watch interviews that Kandil was even doing, you'll see that the host will ask her, like, why are you still posting this stuff? Why are you still doing these things, even though you're getting all of these threats and these horrible comments? Like, why don't you just stop? And there was a real confusion about why she persisted and why she didn't stop. And then suddenly, when the media found out about, you know, where she came from, it was almost like, okay, we're going to give you something that will help you understand why she didn't back off because she is just a trashy woman from this terrible place and she just wanted to become famous and be known. We never really got that fuller picture of where she was from, how she grew up, what her life was like. I started to learn those things when I spoke to her parents and when I went to her village. In July, she returned to her parents' home sort of in an in attempt to escape all of the media madness that had erupted. Can you tell us, as far as we know, how things unfolded on the night of July 15? Yeah, so she she went there because by this point, I mean, the thing with the cleric was going on. Suddenly, all of this information about her life, her marriage, her child, all of it had come out. And these are details that she had never provided to us. She had never wanted that information to be out there. And I think she was scared and she didn't understand at that point that there were so many, especially young women, who were looking at these details coming out and saying, this is incredible, and I can understand what's happened with this woman, and I can understand, you know, the fact that she would have had to work so hard to get to this point, and we didn't even know this backstory. She wasn't hearing any of those supportive messages, and I think the instinct was, I just want to go home, I just want to go back to my parents, I just want to be back with my mother, And she goes back to the family home and her brother came there the night that she got there. And, you know, he was there. They all had dinner. She was playing music for her father on her phone. They were all just kind of hanging out. It was very comfortable. She was finally able to relax. And what they didn't know was that the brother made them all like a glass of milk at night, like hot milk. And he put a sedative in the milk and he gave it to the parents and to Kandil. So they all had it and the parents go off to sleep and Kandil goes to sleep. And, you know, this is something, this is a detail that I really, I find amazing. The fact that he, he drugged her before he strangled her because he knew she would fight back and he knew just how strong she was. This is a woman who had gone on to sort of train in like taekwondo and she was very interested in like martial arts and sort of you know becoming stronger just physically stronger as a person so I even met her instructor like her gym instructor who had worked with her for years and and when we were talking about what had happened that night he said you know that's something that actually makes me it sounds strange but he said it makes me proud that this man knew I'm not just going to be able to go there into her room at night and just do this thing I need to render her powerless first because he knew just how strong she had become so they all sort of go off to sleep because of the sedative and her brother allegedly because that case is still going on with her cousin came into her room and and they strangled her the plan was that they were going to take her body and drive back to their village which was about an hour and a half away and dump her body in the river, that same river that she liked to swim in. They were going to dump her body there. But it just so happened that that night, there was something going on at a neighbor's house, and there were a lot of people there. 
they had no way to sneak the body out and leave. So they left the body there. They stole her earrings. They stole some money. They stole her phone. And her brother went back to the village. And by morning, he was out in the main marketplace, riding his bike around there and telling everyone about what he'd done. And very proud of it and very happy that he'd done it. He didn't even try to hide. He didn't even... When the police came looking for him, they knew exactly where to find him. So, yeah, that's that's what happened the night that she was killed. Did he provide a reason why when he's telling people what he did? Was it something that he was proud of? Like, what, what was his motive that he expressed to people? I don't even think he needed to express any of that because by this point, um, you know, because it had been in the news so much, people in the village who may not have been so active on social media or, you know, Kandil had really changed the way she looked. She changed her name, but she also had really changed how she dressed, how she did her hair, whatever. She'd become quite unrecognizable from when I see pictures of her in the village. She looks quite different, um, more glamorous and sort of dressed up. They had just never made the connection. So a lot of them didn't even know that she was on social media and had become so famous. Like They hadn't put two and two together. But when a newspaper published her name and said, oh, this is the village she's from, suddenly they turned around and said, oh, my gosh, we know exactly who this woman is and we know who her family is. So for some time, the villagers had been going up to her family and saying, you know, why don't you do something about this? And your daughter is so shameless. And now she's accusing this cleric of doing this stuff. And what kind of woman like, is she? And what kind of people are you that you're allowing this to happen So when Kandil's brother killed her and he goes back to the village, I don't even think he had to give an explanation to people. They were just so happy that something had been done, that he had acted, and that their judgment had led to a quote-unquote solution to the problem of this woman. And when the brother was arrested and the police had a press conference and they brought him out, a journalist asked him, why did you do this? Why did you kill your sister? And he said, well, you all saw what she was doing and you all saw the kinds of videos and pictures she was putting up and you all saw what was going on with the cleric. And there's no follow-up question because everyone in the room was probably thinking, yeah, we all saw and we were all wondering how this had been allowed to go on for so long. So for me, that was also a moment when I just thought, how did we end up here? How did we end up in this situation where a 26-year-old woman is dead And no one in the room is asking a second question. And no one is saying, how have we allowed this to happen? How do we consider this normal or accepted? Like, what could this woman have done that's so terrible that to kill her, to end her life, seems to be the most normal or accepted or celebrated response? How did we get here? And what was the response on social media to this news? There was obviously the community that you know you're talking about now who sort of expected this and were wondering why it hadn't been done sooner but then there was a portion I'd imagine who had followed her and you know been a real fan of what she was doing how did they respond to the news a lot of women were really viciously trolled when they would even say something as simple as this shouldn't have happened, or I'm so heartbroken about what's happened. I knew so many women who had to sort of temporarily shut down their Facebook or their Twitter accounts because the blowback was so intense. And people then turning around and shaming them and saying, you're equally shameless. And the fact that you are expressing this grief, like what does that even say about you? And There were rape threats and death threats, and a lot of women were quite nervous. And I think they were dealing with their grief at the time. This terrible and scary thing had just happened. And you're seeing a majority of people around you celebrating that. And then to be in an online space where suddenly strangers are sending you threats, it was a lot. It was, I think, too much for many people. And a lot of women had to go offline at that point and just sort of take care of themselves And even today, I think that reaction still exists. I will still get messages about you're equally shameless. Why did you waste all this time talking about this woman or working on a thing? Like, don't you have anything better to do with your time? So that, I think, persists in some form, even now. You'll see it come up, like, 
on Candil's birthday, if you say something about her online or, you know, on the day of her death, um, if you commemorate it in some way. In Pakistani law, it was possible for the victim's family to pardon a perpetrator, which can occur following an honour killing. What is an honour killing and was it something that was, you know, for lack of a better word, permitted in Pakistani culture? So it's, I wouldn't say culture, just because I don't believe it has any place in our culture. So a loophole existed in the legislation where if you acted against someone to punish them because they had stepped out of line in some way, and this could be your child, it could be your partner, it could be a family member, your sister, in some cases it could be a parent, if you believe that they have stepped out of line in some way which brings disrespect or shame um, or dishonor to your family and you, in most of these cases, it is, it's a murder essentially. An honor killing is a murder. But we, we the phrase honor killing, I know it's, it's really, because there obviously isn't any honor in the entire thing, but it's useful because these murders take place, these crimes take place as a warning to other members of a community or a tribe or a society. It's a warning to say, this person stepped out of line and this is how they were dealt with. And if you step out of line, something similar could happen to you. It's a way to uphold a social code or a sort of power structure that really favors some people. It's a warning. So it's a murder, essentially. But it's really also to say we are not going to allow any kind of change to come about. And if you try and push that through, this is how you can be dealt with. Did Candil's parents attempt to pardon the perpetrator, who in this case was their son? Initially, they didn't. Initially, because a loophole existed in the legislation at the time of Candil's death, which said that the the victim's family can forgive the perpetrator. It's a loophole because usually these kinds of crimes take place within the family. It's one family that is colluding and something happens with the knowledge of everyone's consent, if not knowledge. And it allows something like that to take place. But also sometimes there can be a situation, for instance, if a father kills his daughter... In a lot of these instances, the mother cannot turn around and say, no, I want this man to be punished. I want him to go to prison. I usually the women will sort of move back and they'll say, no, I forgive this person. I don't want any punishment because they have to continue to live in that family. They're dependent on the man. They have to live within their community. They don't want to be judged for sort of pushing harsher punishments or things like that. So that loophole existed and it was really taken advantage of. Because in communities or tribes um, where these crimes would take place, there was a lot of pressure on the victim's family to just forgive the perpetrator. And that's what happened. So they wouldn't even have to spend a day in prison, essentially. When Kandil's brother admitted to the murder, he knew that that loophole existed and that rarely, very rarely, were people actually punished for these crimes. So he was very proud to admit it. What he didn't realize was the legislation changed because of Kandil's murder. There was such an outcry over it. And his parents at the time were even turning around and saying, we want him to be punished. We don't want him to be forgiven. He's done this terrible thing and we don't accept it. But when the legislation changed and suddenly he was looking at life in prison, I think when you're a parent and you've just lost a child... And now you're looking at losing another child, you know, that he's in prison for life. I think they backtracked a little bit and they said, no, we can we move back and we don't want this punishment and what can be done? How do we save our son? A lot of people judge them for that, but I think it's an unimaginable scenario to be in that position, to sort of be so angry with your child that you want them to be punished. But then when that punishment starts to play out, it hurts you deeply and you don't want any part of it. So they, they sort of switched a little bit before the legislation changed and after. Has he been convicted of the murder of his sister? Yeah, so he was convicted at the end of last year, end of September. 
um, and he's in prison for life now. Wow. What do you think that given this story and its complexities and, as you've said, you know, all the various opinions that were projected onto Candil, what do you think is the most important thing for us to remember her by? There's, there's so many things I'm trying to narrow it down to one. I think for a lot of people, the conversation around Kandil, it ended with the trial. It was a three-year trial. And I think the conversation ended there because they said, well, okay, you know, the legislation has changed. The person who committed this crime has been put away for life. And some people got some measure of relief or closure there. I don't think the story ends there at all. And I don't think Kandil's story ends there. I think when I get asked about her and people say, oh, well, you know, this young woman, she didn't she didn't die in vain because look at what happened and the legislation has changed. I think it's horrific that we had to reach that point and for something like this to happen, for that change to actually come about. And for me, it's not the answer. Like, I really question, okay, what does justice mean in this situation? Because... You have someone who's now spending his life in prison. Does he understand what he did? Does he understand why he did it? Do the people around him think, oh, well, he took his family's honor and respect so seriously that he's in prison for life now because of it. And so that elevates him in our eyes. It's important to remember that these crimes take place because a society or a culture is complicit. We allow these things to happen. And why did we not see this coming? Why did we not look at whatever was happening with Kandil and see the red flags and see that a woman was in danger? Why did it take us so long to believe her or to understand that her life was at risk? Why didn't we care about that? She wasn't just someone on Facebook putting up these... She was a real person and... We'd consumed that image for so long. Like, did we forget that she was a person, just a young woman? So, I don't know. I I think what, what I try and really remember is we have to constantly be aware of how we were complicit in this young woman's undoing. And where do you go from there? How do you begin to understand that and make sure it doesn't happen ever again? That's what's important to me. Absolutely. And I think that there's a question why it took the death of a 26-year-old woman to force us to have this conversation in the first place, which I think is just so tragic, but it's an example of using an event like this to have a broader social and cultural and, you know, legal conversation about standards that exist in a country. And that's what I think, you know, your work does so brilliantly is elucidate all of those things that we might not know otherwise. And this is a woman who might have been very easily forgotten if it weren't for the work of journalists like you. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. It's really easy to point fingers at women. But if you just take a look at where she was coming from, you have nothing. The only option you have is to just accept your fate and just die trying to be someone. She died trying to be someone. Because she didn't want to accept this life of abject poverty and in constant humiliation and abuse. You can buy Sanam Meher's book, A Woman Like Her, The Short Life of Candil Baloch, at all good bookstores and via the link in the description of this episode. Images relating to this episode can be found in our closed Facebook group. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join the group. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Elise Cooper.